my heart stopped for a second. In the distance, a castle towered over the rest of the landscape. With each crack of thunder and spear of lightning, the gigantic, fleshy structure was silhouetted in the shadows. Purple clouds hovered over the fortress. It stretched a mile or two wide. In the centre was a spire that rose into the sky, almost up to the clouds. Everything went black for a second. With the boom of thunder, a blue lance shot across the sky and lit up the castle again. At the top of the tower was a bulbous yellow eye. A dark pupil sat in the middle. The eye blinked and everything went dark again. The castle brought back all the memories of my fighting days in Oklahoma. The last time I'd seen one of these fortresses was out in the sprawling oaky countryside. Another freedom fighter once said to me, ah, They make them castles because they're trying to show us who's king now. Afterwards he chuckled, cracked his neck and said, I show them who's king. Well, the next day I found his body on the battlefield in six different pieces. My Humvee's headlights illuminated the road ahead of me. Rats scurried across the street. Rain beat against the windows. I had flashbacks from the day before. Uh, the sound of thunder replaced the singing of the cannons, and the rain was a dull drone of gunshots. I reached the edge of the parking lot. The movie theater was decaying. Moss and lichens draped the cracking walls like Christmas tinsel. Two letters were still left hanging on the side. TH, they read. The rest had fallen and shattered on the pavement. I rolled to a halt by the front entry doors. Vines dangled from the overhang. I paused for a moment, then a distant scream echoed in my mind. Another flashback. Another mutilated corpse. I threw the Humvee into park, stole the key from the ignition and lifted my helmet onto my head, turning on the night vision. I stepped out of the Humvee. The world shaded green by night vision. Fleshy tentacles tickled the air sticking out from behind an abandoned hover speeder in the parking lot. When I blinked, the tentacles were gone. But my insides were wriggling like worms. I shivered. My knees tickled like they might buckle and give out if I hallucinated the tentacles again. Locking the Humvee behind me, I entered the theater. A blurred figure stood in the distance, by the snack bar, obscured by the helmet's low-quality optics. I felt my skin flaring when I noticed him at first. I turned off the night vision and switched on my headlamps. His figure had lost most of its muscle now. When I first met him, when I was four, he was tall and his muscles were bulging. The man who stood there was a skeleton now. He held a mouldy paper cup in his hand, eyeing it down behind the mask of his helmet. Maybe cut the lights, he whispered, his voice echoing across the theatre. Oh, right, I said. Sorry. I heard his footsteps as he approached me, reaching out a hand to shake mine. I gripped it and shook, looking into the mask that covered his face. Its appearance was distorted through the night vision, but I could see markings and paintings over his suit of armor. A rifle was slung over his shoulder, and he wore a bandolier stocked with grenades and flares. It's been a long time, I grinned. Only been four years, he shrugged, snickering. How's that drink? I asked. He scoffed. <laughs> Still good. He chucked the cup behind him. It splashed as it landed on the carpet. Maybe keep it down? I joked. Ah, piss off, he mumbled. Christ, how I've missed you. How have you been? Oh, I've been good. At least I'm doing better than how we did in our Oklahoma days. How have you been? Ah, oh, Jesus, don't remind me about Oklahoma. Fucking massacre. How do you expect me to be doing? We're at war. He patted me on the shoulder then. I threw my arm around his neck and we began to walk towards the snack counter. Well, I see you're still the same man. At least in your head. Where'd all your muscles go? Oh, I've lost it. Times have been rough. Really? I know we're fighting in the same state now, but you haven't seen the shit happening by Omaha. 
Did you see that stronghold out there? One with the massive eye? I took my arm off him. He jumped over the counter, as did I. Yeah, the one with the frickin' eye. You know how many attack rounds we've done on that thing? Not sure I want to know. You're scaring me just talking about it. We've done twenty-three. Twenty-three fucking raids. My jaw dropped, and I spun around to look at him. You can't be serious. I mean, we only did five on that one in Oklahoma. Yeah, that's what I told my commander. He exclaimed, shaking his head. I sniffed. There was mold growing in the back of the popcorn machine. The glass was shattered, leaving behind a thin metal frame. I imagined it being full of butter-scented, fluffy popcorn. <sighs> More flashbacks. This time ones of childhood memories. Skateboarding downtown. Lifting in the mornings before soccer. Getting stranded on the country road at three in the morning. Remember that time we got kicked out of a movie theater with Martin and Xander? I asked. He turned to me. I tried to imagine what he looked like beneath the helmet's mask. I hoped there was a smile underneath that. Was that, um, oh, was that the time when you launched a ball full across the theatre and then you and Xander started fighting with it? And then came the usher. Ah, oh, you goddamn idiots, he sneered. Oh, let's hear about all the bright ideas you've had then. Not getting kicked out? I froze, and then I snickered to myself. Well, I guess you and Martin were the smarter of us four. I stepped over a pile of glass, watching a spider crawl along the wall. Ah, very observant of you. I'm a very observant person, I said. The spider trundled towards a drink dispenser. Just as I have observed this drink machine. I pointed at it. Fascinating, would you not agree, my acquaintance? He coughed and shook his head. Like I said, you and Xander, goddamn idiots. Observe, comrade. I said, reaching out a hand. I pressed the black plastic lever that extended down from one of the soda dispensers. The lever snapped as a dollop of frigid slush splashed out of the machine. It coated my leather glove in muck. I cursed, tore my hand away and shook off the goo. He chuckled for a moment, his arms crossed, leaning against the countertop. There was a spider making its way across the front of his helmet. There's a spider! I know, he said, smacking it and then shaking his gloved hand. Listen, man, I've got a lot to tell you, and it's not exactly good news. Yeah? I asked. He nodded his head. Oh, I'd love to stay here and talk for a while. I'd probably die for it, to be honest, but you and I have both got duties. We're already breaking them a little by even being here. So, why'd you call me out here, then? Just to see me for a bit, or what? He shook his head. I chewed on the inside of my cheek, listening as the rain came down harder. A bolt of lightning flashed through the glass wall on the other end of the lobby. Uh, we'll get to that, but I want to say a few things. I stepped back a little, crunching the glass beneath my boots. I leaned against the drink machine, hearing a definite snap as I touched the plastic. Another splash of murky water dribbled from inside. I'm all ears, Captain. Great. You're gonna need those. He drew in a long breath and let out a heavy sigh. The thunder rumbled again. I think I'm gonna be a dead man after a few days. That's the honest truth. Don't say that. There's only a hundred men left in the Omaha Company. Haven't you heard? Oh, I struggled to say the words. <laughs> You're kidding. Last Saturday, the ravenous came. At least a thousand of them. And they killed three hundred of us. Probably didn't hear about it because the rest of the insurgency doesn't want you to know about it. We didn't stand a chance. They knew where every single one of us was. Don't know how. But they knew where every base, hideout, stronghold, and foxhole was. A few even got found in the tunnels. And now, with only a hundred of us left, we're nothing against the second wave. It's coming. Don't know when, but it won't be long. Feels like they spared us, almost. You know what they can do. 
I swallowed the lump in my throat. A flash from outside illuminated the lobby. I'm, I'm sorry. How many civilian casualties? The silence was cruel. Five hundred, he mumbled. The number had the impact of a bullet. I didn't speak for a minute. Neither did he. The rat squealed. I scanned the theatre, feeling pins and needles all over my body. My hands vibrated, cursed with tremors. I controlled my shaking. So, keep talking, I murmured. He cleared his throat. I don't have anyone left to trust. He paused. I know we fought a lot, sometimes with punches instead of words, but we always apologized after, and that would be the end of it. I'd be a dead man if you hadn't been with me in Oklahoma. You'd have died too, if I wasn't there for you. Yeah, I'm getting sappy, but I don't think I'll ever get another chance to get this sappy with somebody. We're two very, very different people. You annoy the shit out of me sometimes, and I'm sure I piss you off plenty too, but... I have no idea what the hell we'd do without each other. You don't sound like yourself. I mean, you've never been much of a speech giver. He shrugged. You deserve it. You've been my best friend. Always. I don't take this the wrong way, but you're an idiot. I taught you everything. How to talk to girls, how to get some balls. You know, life. But even then, you never used me as the father you never had. You never begged me to help you. And if you did, I told your ass right off. You were my best man at my wedding. You came over and surprised me when I got into college. You convinced me to keep playing guitar when I was going to quit. Called me when Brooke broke up with me and left a box of condoms on my porch as a joke. Stupid as hell, but I needed it that night. He started to choke on his words. Hey, uh... I love you to death, and I can't trust anyone else more than you. My eyes began to sting. My throat got tight, and all the words that had been building up there were now caught in a net. I opened my mouth to talk, but stopped. I swallowed all the emotion back and then took off my helmet. I tapped a button on my armor, and a white beam flashed from the light on my arm. I shone it on my face and spoke in a small, near-silent warble. Take off your helmet, I told him. He hesitated, then, slow-like, his hands grasped the sides of his helmet. He pulled it off, holding it at his side with one hand. With the other, he lit up his face. His eyes were sunken. Purple bags formed under them. His sandy blonde hair was unruly, a wet mop. Streaks of mud coated his chin and jawline. Oh, my friend looked like King Odysseus must have after coming home to Ithaca. He had that lost-at-sea look about him. Now the squirming feeling in my chest was replaced with a frigid, aching sensation. I don't want you to die, I chirped, my voice disappearing. His eyes started to get puffy and red. Don't you fucking cry on me now. If you've ever learned anything from me, it's that you don't need to cry about everything. Now. Like I was trying to say, there wasn't ever another man on this planet that I trusted more than you, and if there was, they're probably dead now. There's not a lot left, but I know what remains. I stared at him, my lower lip twitching. My face began to get hot, I felt my skin turn cherry red. Hope. I chuckled. <laughs> the years have changed you after all. No, it's... Not supposed to sound cliché. My daughter. Hope, he said matter-of-factly. Another mental bullet. I started to frown. What do you mean? I asked. A smirk appeared on his face. He scratched the back of his hand and took a few steps forward towards me. He put a hand on my shoulder, and I looked into his small, hazel eyes. If I'm going to die... I'm not taking hope with me, he said. And this was the third bullet. I stammered as I tried to find the right words. I, I can't take care of her. She's, she's your daughter. My voice began to trail. He shook his head. 
What's the mission of insurgency? he asked. I looked into his eyes again, and the answer came to me. To fight the ravenous, I whispered. Now, think about it. I did. Blue light shrouded us as a fork of electricity blasted across the Nebraska sky. I've done you a thousand favors over the years. And you paid me back by fighting at my side and saving my life a few times. For this, this is more than that. This is my everything. My lips flipped between frowns and smiles. I thought all of my organs were shriveling up and decaying as we spoke. And now I placed a hand on his shoulder. I'll take good care of her. Norfolk's safe, at least it will be for a while. He raised his arm, covering his cough. Perfect. There was another long silence now, filled only by the sounds of scampering animals and ambience of the storm. I love you to death, I said. I love you too, dumbass. He leaned in closer, wrapping his arms around me in an embrace. I held it for a while. We stood there, two grown-ass men hugging in an abandoned movie theater for at least 30 seconds. He let go first. He started by putting his helmet back on and then turning off his light. I followed suit. What remains is hope, I reminded him. He scoffed. <laughs> Idiot. That's more like it. Let's go pick her up. I got some squad mates watching her. She's not far from here. As soon as you get her, you'll speed till you're out of the city. Or at least until you're far enough away from the city that you can't see that fucking eye. Ah, that motherfucking eye, I joked. He reached out his hand and I shook it once more. His grip had lost some of its strength. He now appeared even smaller than he already had at first. His hunched corpse stood before me, still armed and dressed in his battle armor. To fight the ravenous and protect the people, I thought. Right. We started to walk out of the theater. Now you tell your commanding officers you found hope by accident. I want you to take us somewhere in northwestern Nebraska if shit gets heated in Norfolk. Done my research. That's about the safest place. That's the Badlands. Less food. And less of the ravenous. I don't care. I paused. You got it, boss. Yeah, and I know you want your rations too, but don't forget to feed her. I'm listening. He shot me a look. And I got something big to ask of you. I frowned. Now walking slow to a momentary halt. Yeah. If it uh, comes down to it, you'll die for her, right? I winced. I tried to breathe as we started to walk again. Someone's got to look after her, I mumbled. We pushed our way out of the glass doors, walked out from underneath the overhang into the gushing rain. It was coming down heavier now. The earthy scent of mud and fresh rainfall filled the air. Lightning lit up the sky, revealing the castle in the distance. I stared into its bulging eye. I wondered if it could see us. I wondered if that's how they'd found all the freedom fighters. The Humvee unlocked as I pressed the button on the key and clambered into the driver's seat. I pushed the key into the ignition and turned, the engine roaring to life. The windshield wiper started up, waving the sheets of water off the glass. I removed my helmet and fastened my seatbelt. My friend settled in, stretching and scratching his chin. Oh, I guess we do have some time to talk now, I mentioned. He stared at me for a moment, a coy smile tugging at the edges of his lips. <sighs> Just shut up and drive. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, 
Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.